When we measure things, we typically use one of two types of variables. A deterministic variable is a variable that takes on some value. A stochastic variable is a variable that can take on many different values with different probabilities. Deterministic variables are the first sorts of variables you learn about in school. So when you see a number line and the teacher says, find three on the number line, and we can say here is three, and if we say x equals three, it means that x is located at this point on the number line. Or if x equals one, x is located at this different point on the number line. The x doesn't move. When x is 1, it sits here at 1 on the number line. This is a deterministic variable. A stochastic variable is random. It moves around the number line. Sometimes it's at one end, sometimes it's at the other. Sometimes it moves large distances, sometimes it moves small distances. Watch what happens as this stochastic variable starts to take on different values. Each time it appears somewhere on the number line, we put a dot, and these dots accumulate as the stochastic variable moves around. As these dots start to accumulate, they build a pattern. This pattern we call a histogram. It's a visual representation of the different values that this stochastic variable has taken on. If we divide by the total number of observations on the stochastic variable, we get what we call a probability distribution. The probability distribution tells us the probability of the stochastic variable being located at each point on the number line. For example, for this stochastic variable, there's a 4% chance that it will be located at negative 3. There's a 13% chance that it will be located at negative 2. There's a 32% chance that it will be located at 0. And there's a 34% chance that it will be located somewhere between 1, 2, and 3. A deterministic variable is defined by its value. A stochastic variable is defined by its distribution. There are two types of stochastic variables, discrete and continuous. Discrete stochastic variables take on specific values, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. A continuous stochastic variable can take on any value over a range. For example, all the real numbers between negative 3 and positive 3. Different probability distributions define different stochastic variables. For example, the rate of return on a stock is a stochastic variable. Sometimes the rate of return is large and positive. Sometimes it's large and negative. Sometimes it's near 0. We can look at the probability distribution for the rate of return on the stock and say things like the probability of the rate of return on the stock being in this range is 2%, or the probability of the rate of return in the stock being in this moderate range is 15%. The probability distribution for a rate of return on a stock looks like this in part because the rate of return can be large and negative, or large and positive, or anything in between. Take a look now at the stochastic variable that measures ages of people. Now, people can range anywhere from 0 up to some large age. Because ages can't be negative, the probability distribution for ages of people is going to look different than the probability distribution for rates of returns on stocks. For example, the probability of a randomly selected person being a very young age is 10%. The probability of a randomly selected person being a teenager is 15%. The probability of a randomly selected person being very old perhaps is only 1%. The probability distribution tells us the probability of a randomly selected person falling in these various age categories. Now, the probability distribution summarizes everything we need to know about the stochastic variable. But it's difficult to talk about, because typically it's a complex function. And even then, when you show it, you show it graphically. So often, what we will do is use summary measures or summary statistics to talk about the stochastic variable. Two of these summary statistics that we frequently use are measures of central tendency and measures of dispersion. Measures of central tendency answer the question, where is this stochastic variable typically located? Measures of dispersion answer the question, as this stochastic variable moves around, how far does it typically wander? Three measures of central tendency that we use frequently are the mean, the median, and the mode. Consider this example. Suppose we have a stochastic variable that is the number of children in a family. 
and we look around and we take a sampling of different families and we ask how many children do you have and what we find is four households that have no children one household that has two children three households that have three children and two households that have four children the random variable that we're looking at is the number of children in a household and it varies in this sample from zero up to four Let's think now about a measure of central tendency for this stochastic variable, the number of children. One measure of central tendency is the mean. The mean is just the average. In this case, it's 1.9. The mean is a good and a bad measure of central tendency. It's good in the sense that it makes sense if you take all the children that we're looking at and divide them evenly amongst the households, you'll get 1.9 children per household. So in that sense, this is a good measure because it's intuitively clear. In another sense, the mean is a bad measure because 1.9 children has no meaning. Nobody has 1.9 children. You have one child, or you have two children, or you have some other integer number of children. So in this sense, the 1.9 is a bit confusing. So we have another measure of central tendency, the median. The median is what you get when you line up all the households from least number of children to most number of children and take the household in the center. In this case, the household in the center is the household with two children. So the median number of children is two. Now this measure is both good and bad as a measure of central tendency. The good part is that it shows us the center point of all of the households. In other words, 50% of the households have two or more children, and 50% of the households have two or fewer children. Two is the center point. The median can be bad as a measure of central tendency because at least in this case, there's only one household that has two children, so two is not a typical number. So we have another measure of central tendency, the mode. The mode is the number of children that appears most frequently. In this case, we've got four households that have no children, so of all the households that we looked at, zero was the most common number of children to have. So this is a good measure of central tendency in the sense that it, this is the most common of the observations that we have. But it's a bad measure in the sense that it suggests that nobody has any children, when in fact there are many households here that do have children. So what we learn from this is that these measures of central tendency, the mean, the median, the mode, these are attempts to describe what we would otherwise describe using a probability distribution. It's easier to do when we can quote a single number, the central tendency but we lose something because we're trying to summarize a probability distribution that is much more complex than just a single number. Consequently, each of these measures, the mean, the median, and the mode, will have good points and bad points. One isn't better than the other. Which you use depends on what it is you're trying to say about the stochastic variable. Similarly, we have three measures of dispersion. Dispersion measures the extent to which the random variable wanders away from its point of central tendency. The most typically used measure is the standard deviation. This measures approximately the average distance that the stochastic variable moves away from its mean. In this case, the standard deviation of the number of children is 1.7. The quartile divides the number of houses into four equal groups. The first quartile is the line of demarcation between the bottom 25% of households and the top 75% of households. In this case, if we line our households up from least number of children to most and look at the bottom 25%, the number of children in this household that's on the 25% mark is zero. So we say the first quartile is zero. If we go to the other end, and we look at the top 25% of households. So we've lined them up from least number of children to most, and we come along here to the point that separates the 75% of households with less children from the 25% of households with more children. The number of children in this household is called the third quartile. In this case, it's three. So we would say something like 25% of the households have three or more children, 75% of the households have three or fewer. Finally, minimum and maximum are what they appear. The minimum is the number of children in the household with the least children, in this case zero. Maximum is the number of children in the household with the most children, in this case four. This is another measure of dispersion. Like the measures of central tendency, the measures of dispersion aren't better or worse than each other. They're used for different things because each one of them is an attempt to take the richness that's shown in a probability distribution and boil it down to a single number.